So we warmly welcome Graham and Erica up for today's message. Well, good morning. It is such a pleasure to be here with you. Your church is always so welcoming, and Graham and I always talk about that with ourselves. We just love coming here and just getting to meet all of you and learn your names and, and be a part of something bigger than us together. And so thank you so much. We are so excited to partner with you, to be sent out with you, and we're really looking forward to making a gospel impact on our city together. And so like Cecile and Grace shared, Dr. Purby invited us here this morning to tell you a little bit more about Power to Change, the needs on campus, the opportunities on campus, and to really give you a vision for how God can use us together to share the gospel here. And so before I start in a little bit about what God's doing on campus and more about what Power to Change is, I thought I would introduce Graham and myself a little bit so you can know that we're people and not just missionaries, which is I never introduced myself that way. <laughs> and so uh, Graham and I were both from Ontario, actually. We didn't know each other in Ontario. We met here in Quebec. And, um, but it was in university. When I went to university, I called myself a Christian. But for me, that was mostly about going to church on Sundays and trying to be a good person, which I personally found kind of hard. But then I was so surprised to meet all these Christians on campus, and they were so passionate about God. For them, they wanted to know him more, and they wanted everyone on campus to know him more. And I realized that they knew God in a way that I didn't know God, but that made me want to know God in that same way. And so university was where I started a personal relationship with God, one that wasn't just about trying hard, but about really knowing God and understanding grace and that God loves me and it's not about always doing the right thing, but about what Christ did for me. In a similar way, university was where Graham also gave his life to God and he grew up in a Christian family, but it was at university that he realized it was, uh, um, yeah, where he totally surrendered his life. And so it's crazy to think how God can reach ordinary people like me and Graham and how he can send us out and how university is such a key time in, in young people's lives. But um, I also put a picture in so you can see what we like to do in our spare time. You might not know this, but Graham is actually a bagpiper. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, he often likes on a Saturday afternoon, sometimes he'll throw out his pipes and he's, uh, he does weddings and remembrance days. And I had just never met a bagpiper before. We have very, uh, we have very patient neighbors. <laughs> yeah. And I am a diehard basketball fan, and I'm getting excited. Next month is a huge basketball tournament, March Madness, if there's any basketball fans out there. But I've loved actually playing on a local team in the community. It's been a great way for me to get to know Montrealers, too. So there you go. We're more than just missionaries. We're people, and we like Bay Pikes and basketball. <laughs> but next slide. And so many of you already know about Power to Change, and I loved seeing those hands go up. For those of you who are more new to the ministry, Power to Change, we exist to help students uh, discover Jesus, and we want to change the world by helping students discover Jesus. We long for a day when no student graduates without engaging in the life-changing message of Jesus. Now, this is a huge dream. At Université de Montréal alone, there are 42,000 students, but we believe um, that God has called us to reach them and that together we can do more. And so that's our ministry. I love this quote from the president of the UN General Assembly, I believe it was in the 1970s. He said, change the university today, change the world tomorrow. And that's because he knew, the president of the Gener UN General Assembly, he knew that the students on our campuses are tomorrow's teachers, tomorrow's lawyers, doctors, nurses, mothers, fathers, voters. And that if we can capture their hearts today for Christ, imagine how that would change our society tomorrow. So I believe university is a huge turning point uh, for these young students. I love this picture. It was from the student strikes. I think it was back in 2012. You'll remember the big uh, student strikes. And it says, sorry for the inconvenience. We are trying to change the world. Students are going to change the world. The only question is how. And so we have an incredible freedom right now to be on the campuses and talk to them about Jesus. Next slide. Um, <laughs> I'll never forget, there was a girl, I, often in the cafeteria, I'll go out and I'll bring a student with me, and we, we just strike up spiritual conversations. It might be some, through something like the perspective cards or a survey, or just saying like, hey, can we talk to you about spiritual things? One of these girls I met, um, we became friends. We'd go for coffee. I gave her a book by Timothy Keller to read. She'd come with me to the symphony. And I remember her telling me that she had a tattoo uh, right here on her hip. And it was a compass. 
And I said, wow, that's interesting. Like, she wasn't in the Navy. Like, she wasn't into hiking. I was like, why did you choose a compass? And she said, it's because it represents a time in my life where I was just really lost. And I was just seeking and searching for direction. And I just needed to represent that. And it blew me away. (laughs) Because we talk about, we know that people are spiritually lost, but I've never met someone who felt so lost that she inked permanently on herself a compass. And that breaks my heart. It breaks my heart. There's a hemorrhaging faith study that was done a couple of years ago, and uh, it discovered that 50% of Christian students who go to university actually fall away from their faith because there is such tremendous competition on our campuses for their hearts and minds. You have profs who laugh up front in their lectures at the idea that anyone would believe in the Bible. And so there's tremendous need on the campus. Um, But there's also tremendous opportunity. (laughs) Um, In January, Graham had the part, had an opportunity to be a part of something called Uncover McGill. Did anybody here hear about Uncover McGill? Yeah, so a few hands, yeah. So Power to Change partnered with all the Christian clubs at McGill and Rabbi Zacharias Ministries. And for an entire week, they did 15 outreaches. There was three outreaches a day. I was like, who's going to come to all these outreaches? I I lacked faith. (laughs) But there was actually 1,700 students who attended um, this week of outreach. And there was two at lunch, one at supper, and they even gave food to all the students who came. As a result of that, uh, there was three alpha, gra- three alpha groups who formed, one in Mandarin, two in English, and we believe that seven people made decisions for Christ. Sometimes it's hard to, when there's 1,700 people, it's hard to nail down everybody, but we know of seven people who indicated decisions for Christ. Two of them have become part of Power to Change, and others are tracking with their friends. But I couldn't believe this the opportunity in one week, how many students were able to hear different themes of the gospel. Uh, next slide. I love this story. And so Grandma, he works at McGill. I work on the French campuses, UCAM, University of Montreal. But at McGill, there was a girl named Karina. Some of you might even know her. And she was studying in neuroscience. But she, her world just got rocked when she went to university because all of a sudden she wasn't the top achiever in her class. And she, all of a sudden her grades started slipping. And it really made her wonder about her identity. But there was one of her classmates who's part of Power to Change named Katie. And she just seemed so confident. She didn't seem stressed. And Karina asked her, like, how can you just like, keep it all together? And Katie ended up inviting Karina out to her discipleship group on campus, saying, like, here, come, learn, learn, learn about the Bible. And Karina, it just blew her away. Um, and she ended up accepting Christ as uh, on campus that semester. Now, Karina's actually, um, her dad's from Iran, and her mom is from Italy, but she grew up in Montreal all her life, and she she realized, she's like, I want to reach other Francophones. I want to reach people in my city, because this changed my life so much. And so she did an internship with Power to Change. Now she's on staff full-time at University de Montréal. And one of the girls that she met, so Karina's the girl in red, and Claire's the girl beside her. Claire was an exchange student from Germany. And she, we met her at, uh, during Frosh Week, and she wanted to know more. And it was kind of curious because Claire had grown up in a Christian family, but she identified as atheist. So Karina would meet up with her every week or every other week, and they would talk about who is God, why does God matter, who is Jesus, what does it mean that he died on the cross for us? And you know, a whole school year went by, and Claire would come out to our social activities, she would come out to our meetings, but she never took that step of choosing Jesus for herself. And the school year ended, and we were like, oh, that's too bad. But a month later, Claire texted uh, Karina, and she's like, hey, I went to church today, and for the first time, it made sense. And I got it that Jesus died for me, and I want to give him my life. And to this day, uh, Claire's gone back to Germany, but we, uh, Karina's still tracking with her, and she's still walking with God. And I love that, how one girl at McGill discovered Jesus, she got to go and talk to somebody else, and now this girl's out in Germany living out her new faith. And so you never know the difference that one person can make. And that's really um, part of our vision for campus, and part of, as we come together, this is sometimes what it looks like. And so you can see um, this kind of, that group of people, and I love it that I have people like you, who stand behind me and Graham, should have put him in that PowerPoint, and <laughs> you send us out, and we get to go out on campus, but it's your prayers, it's your giving, it's your um, standing beside us that sends us and lets us be there. 
And on campus, I get to meet people like Sandra. And Sandra was, um, she also came to faith during university. And she started investing in girls named Jael and Melissa. And Jael and Melissa are all now discipling other girls. And if you can follow the arrows, you see a camel in the desert and the Eiffel Tower. And that's because all three of those girls, Sandra, Jael, and Melissa, they got to go on mission trips. And Sandra's actually staying in France right now, long term as a missionary. And it's just crazy how there's like a little snowball that grows, 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 grows. And we call that spiritual multiplication and just these chains of discipleship. And we believe that God can use um, these students to change the world. And this is one of the ways how. So I hope that encourages you. I hope it lifts your vision for how you can make a difference on your campus and how together we can be a part of something bigger than ourselves. And uh, these were, I know Dr. Purby was asking me, like, what are different ways we can partner? And I wanted to encourage you that you can make a huge difference. Like, it's just, I love to see students bringing their friends that they meet on campus to church. And I know that some of them here got to have that opportunity. And church is a place where they get to meet generations, different generations, get outside of that student bubble, and they get to hear teaching from the Word. We dream of seeing like students in your church discipling students. And I know that changed my life when someone invested in me and I started to realize, hey, I can disciple people too. We'd love to see people here at Montreal Grace uh, doing that. Prayer. <laughs> I am convinced that I have the ministry that I have on campus and Graham has on campus because of the people who pray. And we are committed to sending you regular updates every six weeks on how you can pray for the campus. And if you'd like to even follow it more closely, totally come up and see me at the end of the service. And I can just send you prayer alerts throughout the week because we need to do battle together on campus. And prayer is where it, is, where it happens. And together we can send to the world. I know the other time Graham and I came, we got to share about our mission trips. And uh, I just think that such, there's such great potential there where we can mobilize people uh, to go to the nations. So those are some of the different ways that we're looking forward to partnering with you. And we want to thank you in advance just for the welcome you've given us. And um, yeah, for, we're looking forward to working together. Thanks, Erica. <laughs> Before we ask. Um, so the elders team at the church invited us here today to share a bit about the ministry, but also to bring the uh, devotional this morning. And so we're now going to turn to the part of the service where we're going to have the reading of God's word and then a short devotion from me. Um, so here to read, I have my beautiful wife, Erica, who's uh, <laughs> going to do that for us. And she's going to be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 to 9, Galatians 5, verses 16 to 26 and Galatians 3, uh, verse 3. So 1 Corinthians 3, verses 1 to 9. But I, brothers, cannot address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now, you are not yet ready for you are still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? Servants through whom you believed, as the Lord assigned to each. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his wages according to his labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. Then we can turn together to Galatians 5, verses 16. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. 
Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. And then Galatians 3, verse 3. Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? This is God's word. Thanks be to God. Well, I want to start off this morning by doing a little thought experiment with you in the room. Um, and so I'm going to present two scenarios to you, and I want you to consider which scenario would be better for your spiritual growth. Two scenarios, which one would be better for your walk as a Christian? So scenario one, you're actually currently living if you're a Christian in the room. Uh, you're saved by grace through faith, uh, you read your Bible, and you are filled by the Holy Spirit 24-7. He resides in you. That's scenario one. Scenario two is similar, but with one major difference. You're a Christian, you're saved by grace through faith, but instead of being filled and indwelt by the Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity, is physically with you 24-7. That means he goes with you to school, he goes with you to work, he goes with you to the grocery store, he goes with you to the gym. Uh, you have one-on-one -on -one time with Jesus um, for the rest of your life. Which one would be better for you spiritually? I just want you to think about that. The next time you're facing a temptation and you're tempted towards sin, which would be better, to have the Holy Spirit or to have Jesus with you? The next time that you're um, struggling to show love to your spouse or respect to your spouse, which one would be better, to have Jesus or the Holy Spirit? Well, it's interesting, the Bible actually answers this question for us. Uh, Jesus himself says in John 16, uh, verse seven, he says, um, but I tell you, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go, the helper, the Holy Spirit, will not come to you. And so Jesus himself in the Bible says, given the option between having Christ physically present and having the Holy Spirit living in us, it is better to be as we are now, to have the Holy Spirit. And if you're like me, maybe you've read that passage before and you know intellectually that it's true, but you kind of struggle emotionally to believe that that's true. How could that be? You know, surely it would be better uh, if the next time I'm reading the Bible and I feel confused, if I could just ask Jesus <laughs> for an answer and have a conversation with him. And as I was wrestling with this a number of years ago, one of my mentors in Power to Change gave me a helpful analogy that's actually stuck with me to this day. And I share it with many of the young men I mentor on campus. And he said, Graham, I want you to imagine that when you graduate from university, uh, you decide instead of pursuing a career with Power to Change, you're pursuing a career in the National Hockey League, in the NHL, um, which would not go well for me, <laughs> uh, given a number of reasons. But for the sake of the argument, that's what we're imagining. Now, I have two options before me. Option number one, I have P.K. Subban, defenseman with the Montreal Canadiens, and he's going to coach me every day, eight hours a day for the next four years. We're going to do drills together. We're going to work on skating backwards, which I'm very slow at right now. <laughs> We're going to work on some stick handling, puck movements, how to read plays. PK is going to be my one-on-one -on -one coach for the next four years. 
And you know what? At the end of those four years, I'm still not going to be in the National Hockey League. <laughs> I'll probably be a better hockey player. I could probably impress the kids on the street uh, with some ball hockey. I'd probably be the best player in my family. But there are certain limitations I have. Coaching can only take me so far. Now, on the other hand, let's say the next time I laced up my skates to go on the ice, the spirit of P.K. Subban was actually able to play through me. And all of a sudden, I had his speed, his agility, his power in my legs. I had his ability to handle the puck, his ability to read the play, and the strength of his slap shot. I'd be playing like an NHL all-star. And that's the difference between coaching, which can take us so far, and actually having the power of the coach within us. And I think it's interesting because the same is true when it comes to the Holy Spirit. Um, we, we can look at it with the disciples. When they had Jesus physically present with them, but when they didn't have the Holy Spirit, the disciples were a mess. Um, they were constantly arguing with each other about who would be the greatest in the kingdom. They had trouble understanding Jesus' teaching. They always had to pull him aside. And even then, they didn't understand uh, often enough. And the moment persecution came, what did they do? They all ran away. Including Peter, even when a little girl said, weren't you also one of the disciples? He denied it and ran from her. Well, what a contrast we see after the day of Pentecost when the disciples received the Holy Spirit. And all of a sudden, they're speaking to the scribes and Pharisees and astounding them with their wisdom. And they're thinking, the scribes and Pharisees are thinking, where is this coming from? These men are uneducated. We see that the disciples are united in their vision for expanding the church. And we see that in the face of persecution, they are bold. And they, uh, they actually celebrate the fact that they are seen by God as worthy to suffer for the name. In short, the disciples were changed men after Christ departed and they received the Holy Spirit. But you know, I think the reason that many of us, given that thought experiment, which would we prefer, to have Christ physically present or the Holy Spirit, I think the reason many of us are attracted to the idea of having Christ physically present, the reason we're attracted to that is because we feel like we've tried living life by the Spirit and it hasn't gone well for us. When in fact, I would submit to you I think the thing that we've tried is living life by our own strength. Living the Christian life by our own strength and not by the Spirit. When we live the Christian life by our own strength, I think that there's three results that tend to happen. The first one, on the one extreme, is we try to white knuckle our religious faith. We try so hard to be good, to avoid doing sinful things, even though we kind of want to do them, to be honest. We try hard to be loving towards people that are hard to love. We try hard to be generous and to give money. We try hard to read our Bible and to pray. We try hard to go to church. And in the end, that type of Christianity is not a joy, it's a burden. Our faith just feels like a list of things that we're supposed to do and a list of things that we're not supposed to do. And it completely lacks joy and it weighs us down. Oftentimes I've lived my life like that. I've lived the Christian walk by my own strength, just trying to work hard at it. And Paul says to me and to you, are you so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Now the other extreme, you know, sometimes uh, we go to the other end of the spectrum. And at this end, we just live in defeat. We accept that we're never going to defeat sin in our life, so we just make peace with it. It's just a little pornography, it's just a little bit of greed. It's just a little bit of self-centeredness. It's not a big deal. And we accept the fact that God is not going to use us in any significant way to advance his kingdom. We accept that we are not going to feel personal intimacy with God. And maybe if you're sitting here, you're kind of like me, in that you swing back and forth between these two extremes. You work hard at uh, white-knuckling the faith, and you get burnt out, you get tired, Maybe something in your life happens and you feel like God isn't holding up his end of the bargain and you get disillusioned and you swing over to the side of saying, it's not worth it. I'm just going to accept my sin. That's how I often live my life. And so when I'm presented with the thought experiment, it does seem attractive uh, to be physically present with Christ because that feels like something I haven't tried. 
One of the additional effects of living the Christian life by our own strength is the impact it has on the non-Christian world that looks at the church. Because they look in and they see a church full of hypocrites who are divided, who are jealous of one another, and who have strife. Now the challenge of living life, uh, living the Christian life by our own strength, that's not a unique problem to the 21st century. In the text that Erica just read for us this morning, we see that Paul uh, identifies the church in Corinth as being people of the flesh. And he points to a number of fruits of their church, strife, jealousy, and division, as evidence that they are people of the flesh. In Galatians, Paul gives a long list of fruit uh, that can make evident that someone is trying to live the Christian life by their flesh, uh, ranging from sexual immorality to idolatry. Now, what is the solution for this? Because uh, Paul has basically set up the problem. The problem with the church in Corinth isn't that they're divided, and it's not that they're jealous, it's not that they have strife. The problem is they are living as people of the flesh. To deal with the jealousy and the strife, those are the surface issues. The deeper issue is that they aren't living the Christian life the proper way. So how do we fix that in Corinth, and how do we fix that with ourselves today? Well, the answer that Paul gives us almost sounds too simple to be true. He says in Galatians, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. The solution isn't just to try harder, just to, just to white knuckle a little more and just kind of hang on until Christ returns. That's not what Paul says. And the solution isn't just to accept that jealousy, strife, those are just normal and we're sinful people. We can't get away from it. We're not supposed to accept either extreme. We're supposed to walk by the Spirit. In Ephesians, another letter uh, that Paul wrote to the church, um, he said, Do not be drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery but be filled with the Spirit. Now, I kind of wonder sometimes why he sets those two in contrast. He could have said anything. He could have said, don't lust, but be filled with the Spirit, or don't be greedy, but be filled with the Spirit. But he says, don't be drunk on wine. I think the reason that Paul um, sets those two up as a contrast is because um, it's an issue of influence. When someone uh, is charged with drunk driving, they call it driving under the influence, a DUI. And I think with the Spirit, it's the same, that what Paul is calling us to is to be more influenced by the Spirit, to have his influence greater in our lives. And I think it's easy to see why this could be a solution to the problem of living by the flesh, to be more under the influence of the Spirit. Just given the text we read this morning, um, a person who lives, like, maybe I'll pause for a moment and just give a bit of a vision of what it could look like to live by the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit, Paul mentions, come to those who live by the Spirit. And so maybe you're like me and, and you need help loving those who are difficult to love. Maybe it's your boss or, uh, or even your spouse at times or, or a child. Maybe you need more joy in your life. Uh, you feel like the kind of person who just the weight of work, the weight of raising a family is just bringing you down and you feel miserable all the time. Maybe you need more joy or peace, patience, I think that's what I need. Uh, walking around Montreal behind people that are walking slow, <laughs> I need more patience in my life. Kindness, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control, the ability to say no to sin. These are things that come as we walk by the Spirit. And so I can see how Paul's simple answer, be walk by the Spirit, uh, can be the solution to the problem in the Corinthian church. Other things that come with being filled by the Spirit. Um, in Acts 1 verse 8, uh, Jesus says, You will receive power when the Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, and, and all Samaria, and to the very end of the earth. And so when we're filled with the Spirit, our evangelism becomes more powerful when we're sharing with our neighbors and our friends. When we're filled with the Spirit, uh, he, he reveals to us scripture as we read it, and he helps point us to Christ and to understand. When we're filled with the Spirit, we're able to put to death the fruit of the flesh in our lives. It's, it's a beautiful image, and, and to be honest, it's the Christian life that I want, and it's the Christian life that I need. 
And I think it's the Christian life that you want and you need too. That we need to stop white knuckling it and we need to stop giving up, but instead walk by the Spirit. And so that leads us to the question of how. How can we, um, going back to Paul's example between uh, do not be drunk on wine, but be filled with the Spirit. We know how to get drunk on wine. Uh, You consume more and you get drunk. (laughs) But how can we be filled with the Spirit. We've already received the Spirit in complete fullness. We can't get more of Him. Well, I think that there's a number of things that we can do to become more under His influence in our lives. And I'm going to give you three ideas that you can take away, and I'm sure that there's more than these you can discuss in small groups and with your friends in the church. But three ideas. My first idea is that we should actually ask God to fill us with the Spirit. In Ephesians, Paul commands us, he says, do not be drunk on wine, be filled with the Spirit. God is giving us an explicit command to be filled with the Spirit. And when God gives you a command and you pray to him and ask him for help to fulfill that command, that is a prayer he is pleased to answer. So how about we stop right now, actually, and I'm going to take a moment and pray that for myself and for you here, and then we'll continue. So let me pray. Father, I thank you that you have a better life in store for us, Uh, a life that is not just being burnt out on religion and just trying to work to be good and work to obey you. I thank you that you have a life that's better than just rolling over and accepting that sin is going to defeat us. You have an abundant life that comes through your Holy Spirit. And Father, I recognize in your word you command us to be filled with your Spirit. And I confess, all too often, I spend my Christian life trying to do it in my own strength and not walking according to your spirit. I confess that. I repent of it, and I ask that at this very moment, you would fill and empower me by your spirit. And I pray that for my brothers and my sisters here too, that they would experience greater intimacy with you, that they would sense your presence in their lives, and that they would experience a joyful walk with you. They would have the fruit of the spirit growing in their lives. Um, yeah, Father, would you, would you increasingly help us to walk by the Spirit as individuals and as a church? I pray that in Christ's name. Amen. So the first was to ask. The second, Paul actually says in Galatians chapter 5, verse 24, uh, after listing the fruit of the Spirit, he says, Crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. Crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. And I think what Paul means by that is submit to Christ's lordship over every area of your life. Often when I'm talking to my disciples, I give them the analogy. I I ask them to draw a picture of a house with different rooms. Uh, So usually they draw a little box with a triangle on top. And I ask them to label each room uh, as an area of their life. So there could be the the study area of their life, represents how they spend their their time at school. Uh, Money, how they handle their finances. Uh, Maybe a room in their life that represents relationships, both friendships and romantically. All sorts of different rooms. And I ask my disciples, would Jesus Christ feel perfectly comfortable in every room of your life house? Or are there certain rooms that he is unwelcome? The example I often give is actually of myself in first year university. Like Erica um, introduced me, I grew up in a Christian family and intellectually I believed all the good things a Christian should believe. I believe Jesus Christ was the son of God, that he died for my sins. I believe that the Bible was inerrant and that in it were the words of truth. I believe that you had to be saved by grace through faith or else experience the judgment of God. I believed all those things intellectually but they hadn't transitioned down to a heart level. In the heart level, I was still living for myself. I was dating a non-Christian at the time, and our relationship was not one that was marked by purity. And so when I was in first year university, I came to a point where I recognized the reason I lacked intimacy with Christ was because I was holding him at arm's length from a very important area of my life. I said, sure, Jesus, you can come in. You can change the way I spend my money. You can change the way I am at school. um, But don't touch my relationships. That's my area. And if that's the way that I interact with God, I'm not going to experience intimacy and fellowship with him. 
And I think many of us, as we walk our Christian lives, are holding God at arm's length from certain areas of our life. It could be romantic relationships. It could be holding on to bitterness. It could be that we want to put ourselves first ahead of others. It could be greed, and we don't want to be generous towards the church and towards the needy. It could be many areas. And what we need to do if we want to receive more of the Spirit in our lives is we need to crucify the flesh and invite God into those areas that we want to hold on to. So for me in first year, what that looked like was ending that relationship with the non-Christian girlfriend. And that year was one of the most transformative in my life for my faith. Because for the first time, Jesus Christ was the Lord of my whole life. And I could experience intimacy with him. So firstly, ask God to fill you with the Spirit. Secondly, crucify the flesh. Give Christ lordship over your whole life. And thirdly, it's a technique that, I, uh, that Power to Change refers to as spiritual breathing. Um, don't be afraid. It's not new age and scary. Um, it's not a term that you actually find in the Bible, but it's, it's a word image that refers to a principle that certainly is in the Bible. And so spiritual breathing involves, firstly, um, we become aware of an area of sin in our lives. You know, maybe, maybe you listen to this talk this morning and you, you feel inspired to live the life by the Spirit instead of just trying your hardest or instead of giving up. And you walk out these doors and within five minutes you fall into lust. Or you get in an argument with your spouse in the car and uh, you say something rude to them. What needs to happen next is spiritual breathing. So first is exhaling. You imagine your lungs almost full of black sin and you exhale. Exhale means you, can, you confess to God, yes, I've sinned. I agree with your word. What I just did was wrong. As soon as you become aware of it, you don't wait until bedtime to confess. You don't wait until church. You don't wait until Christmas or Easter. You do it as soon as you become aware of it. And then the second thing is you inhale. You imagine pure air filling your lungs. You inhale by saying, Jesus, I need you to retake the throne of my life. I, I took the throne of my life in that moment, but I need to give it back to you. And I ask that you would fill me with your spirit, and I ask that you would help me repent, which means you turn away from that sin in the future. I would like to challenge you to try spiritual breathing just for today, even, uh, and see how it affects your walk with the Lord. That the minute you become aware of sin, either in thought or action or inaction, you confess it, and you ask the Spirit to take control, and you repent. And say, give me the power to not do that next time. One of the beautiful things is that in the Christian life, we are not motivated to live our faith in order to earn God's favor or his love. You are loved by God. And you are accepted by God right now as you are through Jesus Christ. He has already forgiven you for every sin you have committed, and every sin you will commit today, this week, this year, for the rest of your life. You are loved, you are accepted. And that motivation is transformative. You might be doing the same things as uh, your neighbor who's maybe a person of a different faith, but you're doing it for different motivations. You're living the Christian life because you're loved and accepted. And so I wanna conclude today just by saying that um, to those of you that are here, maybe like me, to be honest, I'm just gonna give full disclosure. This week, I was a white knuckling Christian and it was miserable. I was angry, I was tired, stressed out, I was snappy with Erica. It was a bad week for everyone. And I wanna invite you today, if you're that kind of person that is just trying so hard, there's a better way. And that way is walking by the Spirit. And if you're here this morning and you're living in defeat, you've just accepted that Pornography is going to be a part of your life forever. You've accepted that um, you're never going to be a loving person. You're always going to have bitterness in your heart. There is a better way, and it's walking by the Spirit. The Apostle Paul invites us to walk by the Spirit, and I want to invite you to walk by the Spirit. Let me close in prayer. Father, I thank you again that... Um, in the Christian life, we are motivated not to earn your love, but because you are, have already given your love. I pray that um, 
us as individual Christians and us as a church would increasingly walk and rely on your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would change our lives and that each and every year we would look back and be amazed at the growth that we have seen. I pray for those of us that are trapped in a cycle where we feel like we are working and working and working at the Christian faith. I pray that your peace would come to us and uh, that Jesus would take that burden from us and we could walk a joyful, light Christian walk. I pray for those of us who have given up, Father, who are just defeated. I pray that we would, we would take the step of faith to trust you, to trust your spirit, and we would see victory. Lord, it's not an easy thing. It's not a simple thing, but it's a thing that we can trust you for. And so we invite and ask your spirit to fill each of us individually and us as a church. I pray that in Christ's name. Amen.